Hello everyone, I am Bradley Swart, Associate Professor of Computer and Information Science at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. This video today is going to look at the state design pattern. We'll talk generalities a little bit up front, but my example is going to go into hard code, hardcore C++. Day. So, oops, I meant to. And then so, uh, I've already done a video on the strategy pattern, and you know, so you'll see that state and strategy is very similar. They're definitely not identical. They say that they are, but in a lot of cases that I see, they're not truly identical. And like when I first started doing my research on this, I'm like, you know, <laughs> prove me wrong. These are the same things. But they do have some, you know, like it's the way in which they're used is definitely different. So check out the way I've used uh, the, the strategy pattern and then check out the way I'm going to use the state pattern today, and you will see that uh, they are there. There are similarities, but they are definitely not 100% the same. And so, uh, anything else? It's and again, it's more in the way that you use it. What is the purpose? A strategy pattern is used. We I used it for sorting, and I said like if I want to change the way I can so, I sort something, I can do that. Um, as you know, I could just go ahead and change the the strategy object sitting under the hood and state again is similar but instead of solving a problem in a way it's state is more like a finite state machine like uh, uh, like a video game example I'm going to show today where like you have a jump state and a stand state and a walk state and a fall state and it's different states and like in, in like a video game if I press the space bar I should go from stand to jump and when I hit the apex of my jump, I should go from jump to fall. When I hit the ground, I should go from fall to stand. Those kind of things. Those are that is the state pattern that I'm thinking of, and and it's you. You basically can't get things done the same way as you can with strategy. And you'll see uh, in my example that the basically the two objects are communicating to each other. They they both have references to one another. Strategy does not necessarily have a reference. To the what I call the owner object, the owner of the strategy. That doesn't mean you can't, but then it seems like then more of it's more of a state strategy, or a straight pattern, or a state pattern anyway. Okay, so again, it's a behavioral pattern that allows an object to alter its behavior when the internal state changes, and it's close to the this concept of a finite state machine. Another good example is always a vending machine. You know, you can't, you generally can't just walk right up to a vending machine, hit the buttons, and, <laughs> and, and sodas just come flying out. And it actually did happen one time back in the old days, back when people could actually meet up and be around each other. Um, students were taking a test, and out of nowhere, just, just a bunch of F words, like, what the... A kid, the kid hit the lottery. He just the machine was broken or whatnot, and every time he pushed the button, he was getting a soda. He got ten, twelve sodas. I was nice. He I, he gave me one, but I gave him a couple bucks for it just because. What the heck? That was amazing. But any other times, you are not going to hit the you're not going to hit the you're not going to hit the jackpot. The button registers, but it doesn't do anything. But why not? Because you didn't insert any money. Well, how does it know? And that's where the idea of the state machine comes from. And so you could, a lot of students start out, and not me the same way, where you're like, well, I'll just put everything in one object, and I'll just have a ton of if statements. And I go, you can do that, but oh my goodness, try doing that for anything of substance, and you will see that you'll, you're going to have a bad time quickly. So, uh, so this can be a cleaner way for your object to change its behavior at runtime, and that's what I'm saying here, without resorting to conditional statements, and main, it improves maintainability, but you're writing a lot, you're writing many smaller objects that all kind of communicate together, and you definitely have to have uh, documentation somewhere in some form to understand how these things all tie together. So the state pattern is used when you want to change behavior, like an internal state, like I've mentioned a few times over now, and Everything should be defined independently, and by that it means that when I add a new state, it doesn't necessarily affect the behavior of the existing states. You probably will have to go back and change things up a little bit, because that's the whole point of a finite state machine, is like, how do I get into and how do I get out of this new state that I'm trying to add in? But it's not necessarily uh, forced on you. You don't have to recompile any of the rest of the pro the rest of the classes to get this new state to work if you don't necessarily want to. 
Okay, so one more, you know, a little bit more here. So like you say, state-specific behavior within a class is inflexible. You know, when you start to do this, because it commits your class to particular behavior, and if I wanted to add more code, I have to recompile the entire the, the entire class. And we're trying to keep things as simple as possible on compile time, on link time, on runtime, on you know efficiency everywhere, and that just kind of goes against that. So the state pattern that we're going to use today, we're going to define a separate object that, you know, like there's a pure virtual function that's going to be in the base class. That seems to be a common theme in a lot of uh, design patterns. And, um, and in, the, in the derived classes, they're going to de we're going to override that function to do what I want to do. If I'm in, you know, you're going to see I'm going to be in a jump, pat jump state and I'm going to have a countdown timer. They're like, well, when am I out of the jump state? Countdown, countdown. When I hit zero, I'll change back. So let's see, the class delegates state-specific behavior to the current state object instead of the state-specific behavior directly. So it calls the object instead of going through a whole bunch of if statements trying to find out what's going on. So this makes the classes independent of the behaviors. Every behavior is independent of every other behavior. Then they're, all, then they're all tied together. New states can be added by just defining new derived classes that go off of that base class. And at runtime, you just change the current state object, and everybody's happy. And so here is oops, here is the class and sequence diagram. If you look at this, you compare this to strategy. They just change the wording around a little bit, but it's pretty much exactly the same thing. And again, my the de my demonstration today is going to be slightly different because the state the state and the context, meaning the object and the state pad the state machine itself. Are going to be are going to know of each other. We're going to pass references. the The player is going to know about the state, and the state is going to know about the player. And I'll show that here in a. Okay, so here is my really cool example for my state pattern. Here, I have my main function. Let's just say I, I you know, where am I going to start with this whole thing? There's nine files here. So my main. Look at this, right? All I'm doing is running 50 steps of a of a you know theoretical game or something like that. So I have a player pointer, new player, and then I go 50 steps. And notice I just got player step, player step, player step, player step. And then when it all comes through, I delete off the player, which is fine, so I don't have any memory leaks. And I return zero. And even in the player.cpp, player arrow step. All it's doing is calling current state that step, so it's it's indirectly calling all these different things. So the player object, it looks complicated. There's a lot of code here, but it's really not so bad. The player object has a state, and it's con and, it, and it's maintained as not as an is a. This is not inheritance. This is a composition. The player has a state, so this state is sitting under the hood as current state and in the constructor it sets it up as stand state. You have to start somewhere. I'd probably start it out as maybe an init. I guess it doesn't need a init. It's not like a it's not like game maker or unity or anything like that where we don't have access to the pure constructor most times. But anyway coming back here I have the constructor. I have my state that is maintained. I have a step event that is basically, you know, basically if you want to think of one game frame or just one tick of the clock, what would happen to my player, what it, what would happen in the next game frame. And then I have a templated function, that's why I have to put it in here, that says what do I do if I change the current state. And we have to watch out since we're dealing with pointers and we're dealing with newed up memory and all sorts of stuff that you notice like I call this and I say, okay, I'm printing out, well that was weird, and then I delete the current state and I fill it up with a new, with whatever, new t this. Isn't that fun? And what that means is, I'm, you know, when we show this somewhere else, that I can basically supply the new type as a parameter, as a template parameter, and then that way I don't have to new up anything anywhere else but inside of this one function. Because newing could be a, you could have problems in, with newing things up depending on a lot of different things. So I delete off the current state and I replace it with a new one so I don't have any memory leaks and I replace the old state with the new state. Okay, so let's see. And again, there, here's my constructor that sets up this current state. And every time I say click, 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 whatever that state is, just calls that step function. And this thing you're going to see is a virtual function. 
Okay, so pretty much the rest of the, dis of the discussion here is about the state, the state pattern, or the st like the state base class and all of the derived classes that come from it. So as I was discussing a second ago here, the player has, has access to a state object. And if you notice here that the state object has access to a player through the pointers. You know, so player has a pointer to state, state has a pointer to player. And so that way they can communicate to one another and it, it, it adds some complexity and also adds some little things that can trip you up if you're not paying attention. And it basically applies the same way in, especially in Game Maker. I don't know how it applies directly in Unity and Unreal. I haven't tinkered too much in those kind of tools. But in Game Maker it is the same kind of thing. If you change state and then continue to run code, you can run into big problems. But anyway, okay, so the base class as a constructor that passes in the owner. Which player is it that this state belongs to? Um, oh, I did not put a virtual, this needs to be virtual. I never, I forgot about that. I was, you know, that's, oopsie. That happens a lot. You remember the destructor, sometimes you don't remember the, that it needs to be virtual. And so, and so it needs to delete the player, and, it, oh, and does it need to delete the player? That's the fun of this. The state is going to maintain itself. Everything is going to be okay. If we don't worry about you know if we don't worry about deleting the player, and this virtual void function step we discussed this a couple minutes ago that this virtual function here gets called right here and depending on which derived state I'm in, it will call the correct step function, and I made it pure virtual. You don't have to. It's it's perfectly okay to also leave it with nothing in it, but it's also okay to make it so you have to define it. Uh, in every subclass. This makes this thing abstract so you can never create state directly, which in, in my mind is just as fine as just putting this in. You know, it's one of those, it's just six of one half dozen of another. So as it comes to the constructor, the virtual, it's a virtual destructor, it doesn't really do anything. You're like, and this is what it says here, nothing here. You're like, don't I have a pointer? I have the pointer, but I didn't new it up. Someone else newed it up. So it's not my responsibility to really go in here and delete the player that I'm connected to. It's up to the player to delete that when it hits the you know when it hits the destructor. Oh, I don't have that. I should. Oh, uh, well, I'll figure it out at some point. The player gets created and destroyed here. So uh, there's a lot going on here, right? There's nine files, so it can get a little tricky. So I'm sorry if I'm not 100% succinct with what I'm trying to talk about here. Okay, so now the state knows about the player, there's a virtual destructor, and then everybody defines step. So let's look at the stand state. So it needs a constructor, and it gets passed in the player, the owner, the player object as well, and it overrides the step event. And just to make it a little more interesting, I added a countdown timer. So this thing will sit in the stand state for some number of uh, game frames or some number of step events. So let me just show you here the CPP. And it shows, here is my constructor, here is my step event. So it says, okay, the player gets passed into the stand state, because it does that here, right? Here, new stand state, this. This player object gets passed in as the pointer to stand state here. And so, okay, good. It keeps that, it passes that owner up to state, so that thing is maintained here in this guy here in the state. Okay, oops, and then it sets the countdown timer, just randomly picks 5 plus random 6, so anything from 5 to 10. 5 to 10 is the countdown timer, and I just put a print in here just to show what's going on. And then the step event itself, when, I call, when it calls the step over here, when it calls this step event, which calls this step event, which finally goes into this step event, it prints out, works the countdown timer, and then goes, oh, hey, did I hit zero? And then if it does, this, this is how I change the state. Owner, which is the player, call the cur change current state function using jump state as the parameter, like the templated parameter. Because otherwise you would new it up here and pass in a nude object to the other place, and that could cause trouble if you have new, 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 new across 3,000 places in your program. And then you're like, well, I, I, I need control of that. This allows control. So if I need to change the way my, my memory is allocated, I only have to do it in the one place instead of all sorts of other, all sorts of places. I can just change it right here. 
Okay, so then that handles going from stand state and keeping in the stand state and then moving over to jump state. And jump state is basically the same kind of thing. There's a constructor, I override the step, and I also have a countdown timer. Same kind of deal. And then player owner gets passed into the state, gets passed up to its parent. Countdown timer's a little slower, or a little the number's a little less, because the jump, especially the way I jump these days, there there is no jump anymore. And so it's for anywhere from two to four units. And then it's the same deal. Show me the countdown timer, and if so, change from the jump state that I'm in into the stand state. And now that you can see these comments about being careful, let me show you what, let me just show you what's going on here. Let me show you why that is important. Let me first run this and just show you the output. Because you'd think, you would think nothing happens, you see this player step and you see this player step and you're like, oh goodness, like if you didn't know anything, if you didn't know any better, you'd be like, what in the world am I looking at? Nothing's gonna happen, but when you run this, you can see here that a whole lot of nothing, there's a whole, there's a whole lot of real stuff going on here. So, and this is everything that's going on in all of the 50 steps. And then I'm changing states and I'm doing all sorts of stuff. So it is pretty, you know, it, it works, it is pretty cool. But let me show you what happens right here when I change states. Go from stand to jump. And that's, so, okay, so right now owner, the player, is this player object, which is, you know, it's never going to change. But let me go into here, F11 in, and there is the code. I call, I'm changing state. Yeah, it's unfortunate that templating, you can't uh, debug templating. But now, current state is is a, it's hard to put it in here. It's a stand state object. So it's going to delete that. So in, in, yep, now you can see it's deleted because now it's all been wiped out. That memory has been given back to the operating system. And now you're going to set up the new object. And now current state with the countdown of four is now the jump state instead of the stand state. But look where I go back to when I, when this, when I hit F10 one more time. Okay, the object is now a jump state, but I'm in a, I'm still, if you know, there, if there was code here, I would, I'm still in the stand state's code. And you have to really watch out for this because the, technically this object has been deleted, but an object is purely memory or it's purely data. So functions are stored in memory in a different place than actual, you know, actual data is stored. But it's still code that needs to run. So as long as I don't try to access any member variables of this stand state, I could do stuff, but you should never risk it. And so that's what I'm saying, like be very careful because you're technically finishing up the deal here for a stand state object, but you're really supposed to be a jump state at this point in time. So you, so like, so what you could do is something like this, where you put a return in right here, just to make sure. And in Game Maker, they, like, they highly recommend putting an exit in, which is basically the same kind of deal, because you want to make sure you don't accidentally do anything else once you change states. And that applies for the stand state, and it also applies for any state. Any state change, you want to get out of that function, because you can't really put it into, you can't put it where the, uh, uh, can't, geez Louise, where is it? You can't put it in here, because if I do a return, it just kicks me out of this function and still takes me right back to where I was anyway. So you have to watch out. But that's like, like the, you know, the big caveat here, is to just be careful when I change states, and I'm deleting the, the state I'm in, that I can still run code. It's, it's, very, it's one of those things, it feels like you should never do that. You're like, oh my god, I'm gonna crash. Well, technically you, you don't crash until you try to access the data under the hood, because then you're trying to access, instead of accessing code, which is perfectly legitimate, you're trying to act, you're trying to act on data that's been deleted, and the operating system now says, no, you cannot touch this, and it crashes on you, so watch out there. Okay, so out of this, coming back again, those are the nine different files. So again, here is my parent class. It maintains the owner for everybody. Virtual destructor, step event that everybody takes over and does differently. I mean, they kind of do the same thing here, but you can imagine you can do anything you want inside of this step event and nobody is the wiser. Um, Say. So if you need to, you can use the destructor. You can use the constructor to initialize all the data you need for this state. 
You can use the destructor because the thing is being deleted if you need to free up any memory or anything or just handle anything else as the object's being deleted. So, so you get create, you get step, you get destroy, and anything else, you know, architecturally you would have to put into the system yourself. If I'm dealing with video games, you could have begin, begin step, step, end step, and all sorts of other different functions. Uh, if you've ever worked with Game Maker, you know that it's the, the engine is a whole a whole working machine with lots of different pieces and parts. So each state implements all that it has to of the state pattern and adds whatever it needs to. And then the player just goes ahead and just takes everything and just slaps it in and just very nicely uses that. So it just uses it as a has a instead of an is a, and everybody's happy and then just coming back here just saying. I can call this function over and over and over again, and it will destroy, and it will create a new new step, a new object in its place, which is really cool. And that's why this comes out so simple. Everything else is really complicated, but everything else, once you get there, your main code and even your player code is, is just so simple at the end of the day. And that's the whole joy of making an engine and trying to come up with a way to, to make it very easily usable for other people. Because you, know, you put the cool, hard stuff, you write it once, and then you don't have to worry about it ever again, and everybody else can just slam it in and make it work. Uh, there was one little last thing I wanted to discuss, but I forgot about it while I was talking. Um, but if it comes up, I'll think about it, and I'll remember. I'm not 100% sure here. Oh yeah, adding new states, as we were discussing. It is, is, in this case, it's just a matter of adding a class that derives from state. Basically doing the same thing where I, I have to have a constructor because I have to pass the owner along. Uh, I have to have I have to override the step event, and I have to have something. It doesn't have to be a countdown, but it could be other things. You know, it could there could be many different things that's going on, especially when it comes to like physics engines and things like that. But again, the tricky part is you don't have to tie in the other states. But from a video game standpoint, like in this case, if I'm standing. Maybe I want to. Maybe there's input. Maybe the user input. Like if I press a certain button, I I I I'm now walking instead of jumping. Or if I press a different button, I'm now jumping instead of standing, and so forth and so on. And so it you, it says you don't have to change the code for other objects, but the reality is, as a finite state machine, you generally do go in and change the code because everything kind of has to work together. And that's kind of where the one of the where the similarity ends between state and strategy pattern because the state patterns everything kind of works together, but the strategy pattern is a you know every every definition of a strategy like a concrete strategy is is a very concrete way to solve the problem and they really don't interact too much but the state pattern does. Um, so I think that pretty much well covers what I'm trying to get across here. So thanks for sticking it out with me. If you have any questions, uh, swordb at cod.edu or comment below, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you have a better way to do this, I'd love to hear this because this is just my uh, couple days worth of research on the topic here. But, uh, well, over you. Know, uh, just to try to make sure that I know precisely what I'm trying to tell you guys and trying to do things the right way. So, again, thanks for sticking it out with me. Have a great day. I'll see you next time.